the big mistake to start with. Uh, so today we have the second part of the FRB seminar by uh, by Jonathan Katz. Uh, so um, I think it was five weeks ago. He had 22 papers on FRBs, and I checked this morning, and he, it was up to 24. Uh, and I think those numbers are comparable to the number of repeating words that some FRB repeaters show. So well, I'm, I'm starting okay, to get. Okay, no, there are actually two papers out, and each of which have more than a thousand verse from a single repeater. And maybe there are 22 repeaters, but they have a lot more verse. Yes. Yeah, so I, well, I, I was just starting to wonder if it's worth doing a temporal analysis to see if there's any characteristic time scale between the your paper output or <laughs> if they follow one over F. I don't know. Uh, so yeah. Bond cycle is correlated with the number of Republicans in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> okay. So this leads to the basic question. Some of them repeat, some of them don't. And um, most of them don't. Um, but on the other hand, you get a lot more verse than the ones that do repeat. So are they fundamentally different phenomena? Superficially, they're roughly the same. The bursts are similar, although repeaters have some characteristic, characteristics that are not, have not been evidently seen in non-repeaters, but they're seen in the same part of the spectrum. Well, mostly that's because the same part of the spectrum where radio telescopes operate in, or at least that's a plausible explanation. The time scales are roughly similar. Um, they have, you know, some of them are polarized, some of them aren't. That applies to both categories. Um, they appear to be at sort of cosmological or what I call <coughs> near cosmological distances, the redshifts of from several tenths to probably one or two. Some identified with much closer sources. So there's a lot of qualitative similarity. Um, a few differences, something that's called the sad trombone effect, which is seen in repeaters and not non-repeaters, but maybe it varies from individual source to individual source. And it's not, you know, like saying something that is, produces visible light and something else produces x-rays. It's not as dramatic as that. So the question you want to ask is, are they different phenomena? In other words, if you will, do you need, you know, are there two different kinds of things going on here? Is there something that repeats very frequently and something that may be a catastrophic event. Okay, so let's see where we can go with that. Yes, okay, well the arrow doesn't seem to be working. Oh, that, okay, let me see. That might be the where I'm kind of clicked out of the... Okay, so now it should. Okay, fine. Arrow support. Yeah. So the um, Obvious question is, do non-repeaters non simply repeaters that repeat very infrequently? Already there, there'd be something dramatic because repeaters that have been studied at even at the level of sens detection sensitivity we have now um, have repeated quite well. In some cases, I was just mentioning more than a thousand times. That's actually, I think, in a single paper. But with repetition rates of order once per minute over a several hour or a few hour observing interval, non repeaters clearly do not do that. The longest stretch of observation I was able to find of looking at a non repeater, or a parent non repeater, they should be called apparent non repeaters, um, is uh, some tens of hours and there were no repetitions. So that already leads one to suspect that there's something fundamentally different. Okay. Repeater bursts drift, bursts of repeaters drift to lower frequency. It's called the sad trombone effect. And that has not been seen in non repeaters. It's sort of qualitative, but it's distinctive if you look at it. If you try to estimate duty factors, that's the fraction of the time they're on. Of course, that depends on detection threshold. They appear to differ by orders of magnitude to the best you can estimate them. So, for example, if something has a burst a few milliseconds long, and it's a thousand, and it's observed for ten thousand seconds. That puts you um, a few milliseconds divided by ten. It's you know something times ten to the minus eight. Actually, on the low side of ten to the minus eight. Um, repeaters, well, milliseconds every minute. So, but again, you don't know if this is two ends of a continuous spectrum. So, there's no very clear answer to this. Um, there have been a long history in astronomy of things that were originally categorized together that, that turn out to be totally different. 
for example, supernovae. Once upon a time, supernovae were called novae, it was new stars. Um, and then only when 1885, one was seen in the Andromeda galaxy, people realized it had to be a lot more luminous than the comparatively common phenomenon called novae. The first soft gamma ray Peter was called a gamma ray burst. You go back to the paper and it calls it a gamma ray burst. Well, the distinction wasn't made. Pretty soon it was realized, not that soon actually, that the spectra were significantly different. And of course, that one category repeated and the others didn't. Gamma ray bursts themselves are divided into long and short. Originally, it was just a question of whether they lasted more than two seconds or less than two seconds. Now they're believed to be fundamentally different physical phenomena. And supernovae, well, it's not just two categories. They started out as type one and type two, and they got divided and divided and divided. And now there's this whole zoo of, of subtypes. Okay. So non-repeaters are harder to study than repeaters because you can't localize them very well. You have approximate position, but it's the beam width of the telescope. You can't do it interferometrically because you just pick it up once in one survey. So they're harder to study. Um, but anyway, one needs to think more about them and see if this works. Okay. First, the next question, which is sort of a general question applies to all of this. Are they collimated? Well, there's no direct direct way to determine if they're collimated. But if you try to construct a model, you need to know the total power. And if the thing is radiating more or less isotropically, as a great many things in astronomy do, stars, supernovae, and so on, uh, then, um, then you multiply by 4 pi r squared to get to turn the observed intensity into a power. On the other hand, if they're collimated, the total energy required is less. On the other hand, the chance of observing it is less, which means there's got to be a lot more. No direct evidence for this. Um, collimation is very plausible because physical processes people talk about involve relative radiation by relativistic particles, um, which is intrinsically collimated to one over basically one over the Lorentz factor if it's a collimated beam of particles, but um, you don't have any direct evidence. Do okay, mind, well, the, it, in, do, in your mind, that's what, the, what is known about the distances. The distances, okay. Um, the it, dispersion measure, if attributed to the intergalactic medium, which is you, you, plausible and usually the case, puts many of them at redshifts of about one. A few have been identified with specific galaxies at redshifts of several tenths, 0 0.193, 0 0.241, things like that. One was identified with a globular cluster of all things in a nearby galaxy, I don't remember the name of the galaxy, three, three and a half megaparsecs away. And there was a very similar event that may or may not be the same thing <coughs> on a very lower energy scale it's identified with the soft gamma repeater in our galaxy at a distance of something like well, somewhat uncertain six kiloparsecs. So there's a broad zoom. Well, okay. If you assume isotropic emission of cosmological distances, then you're talking about powers of 10 to the 43 Earth per second for a few milliseconds which is a great deal. If you collimate it, of course, it's a great deal less. If you come down to six kiloparsecs, uh, rather than the cosmological few gigaparsec, as there was one, well, it was actually extremely intense. So you recover some of those orders of magnitude, but they're still talking 10 to the 37 or something per second. Okay. So the point about collimation is if you have a model that's like a pulsar, whose instantaneous power is limited by the magnetic dipole spin down rate, then to, come to see if the parameters are reasonable depends on degree of collimation. And one can talk about five or six orders of magnitude of solid angle. Why? Because when you try to make reasonable estimates of the Lorentz factor, it's a few hundred, and so that comes in squared and then the solid angle, and that's five or six orders of magnitude of power. So, for example, if you try to power these things at cosmological distances by spin down power, you get impossible numbers. You get a millisecond pulsar with a magnetar light, 10 to the 15 gauss magnetic field. And among other problems, that thing would spin, spin down too fast for the repeaters that are known to, at least one has been observed for a decade. So, it's a trying to, so, it's, collimation is a question you have to ask. 
Okay. Can we estimate it? Well, okay. Suppose we have a collimated beam of rope with the charges. That there's the um, uh, minimum Lorentz factor is uh, to radiate a frequency omega. You need a Lorentz factor like that, a hundred or a couple of hundred, if R is a radius of curvature of a neutron star with, or a neutron star inner magnetosphere. If R were larger, then Lorentz factor would have to be somewhat larger, but it's only a cube root. So you tend to think in terms of Lorentz factor is about 100. Okay, here's a general expression for the angular distribution of radiated power, and it looks a little complicated, um, but uh, it's easy to see that the, since gamma and theta come in, theta is the angle from the direction of the radiating electron, since gamma and theta come in as the product, it's easy to see that it falls off rapidly if gamma is if theta is more than one over gamma, and that's why we always say that the beam, um, beam that the angular pattern is of a radiation by an accelerated particle is one over gamma. This is the explicit expression from from electrodynamics, but simply from special relativity, if you calculate if you see what happens to the angle when you Lorentz trans of something that radiates that say isotropically, which is a quantitatively, but not that far from in its own rest frame, into the laboratory frame, and simply do the Lorentz transformation of vectors, again, the width is about one over gamma. Okay, so could one estimate this um, uh, statistically from the distribution of intensities of an individual burst, but let's, you know, a simple model, individual burst er. Suppose a, a, an individual source, suppose that individual source radiates more or less isotropically in its own frame, sometimes pointing towards you, sometimes pointing almost towards you, sometimes pointing way off from you, what would be the distribution of intensities or energies that you would see? Well, it turns out to be this, the weird thing you say, where does that funny spike come from? Spike doesn't make much difference, but it comes from the fact that in this last equation, you've got a term in the azimuthal angle, phi. And as a result, this function is stationary at a certain combination of phi and theta. And because it's stationary, you particularly you have particularly many events satisfying that condition. And that gives you that little spike, which actually is very little. It's just so strange when you look at it and say, where did that come from? but it actually has a very little practical significance. So if you could measure the distribution of intensities for em source emitting in random directions, since as far as the source is concerned, it doesn't know where we are, um, uh, you could in principle determine the degree of collimation comparing to this distri frequency distribution, which it turns out is almost, you see I give it the three values of the Lorentz factors, almost independent of the Lorentz factors. So let's think about the environments these may uh, occur in. Okay, so we've got here as a graph of the measured dispersion measure versus the distance in terms of cosmological redshift for the dozen or so fast radio bursts that have identifications with galaxies or other astronomical objects, um, and therefore whose distances are known because you identify the galaxy and measure the galaxy's redshift. And um, well, you can see this is a rather recent paper. It came out last October. Okay. Well, for, so one of the hypotheses that one would naturally consider is that this thing, that these fast radio bursts are produced by young neutron stars. After all, they're a little bit like pulsars, so that they have coherent radio radiation. And pulsars are produced by neutron stars compared <coughs> to young ones. And young, particularly young neutron stars are found usually in supernova remnants, because that's how they're born. There may well be neutron stars that are born without a supernova. That's a long standing speculation. But certainly many of them, perhaps all, perhaps only most, are found in supernova remnants. Supernova remnants are a comparatively dense gas cloud and will give you a certain amount of dispersion measure, integral electron density along the line of sight, and even rotation measure. Okay, so what we have here is a graph that shows the uh, dispersion measure versus um, distance. And there's a small contribution from our galaxy. That's the stuff off of those green lines on the left-hand side. You expect a near proportionality 
from the intergalactic medium. Now, I say near proportionality because the redshift's less than one. It's essentially proportional. Of course, the large redshift is more, is more complicated. Um, and so you see a diagonal swath that's um, you know, extending upward to the right with a dashed line in the center, which is a cosmological model. And you see the error bars for the various um, uh, fast radio bursts. And some of them lie along that line, which indicates that there is no large additional contribution near source. Some of them are below the line or off to the right of the line. That's the same thing. Be about five of those, which indicates there is a near source contribution, which shouldn't be enormously surprising. If this is in galaxy, the galaxy has a contribution just as our galaxy does, or maybe a supernova remnant. And then you see one way off to the right with nearly a thousand parsecs per cubic centimeter extra, and that must be an anomalous near source contribution. Maybe a young supernova remnant, maybe not. Anyway, near source contribution, and very large. It's, it's uh, nearly a thousand uh, parsecs per cubic centimeter. So, in fact, I wrote one of these recent papers. This is this one in the supernova remnant, which I first thought I no longer believe that. And if I don't run out of time, I'll have more to say about it. Okay, so this, again, recent discovery. You can see how recent it is. Um, so here measures of, the, I'll show you more data on this thing that just came in last week. Um, dispersion measure versus time. And there's a lot of scatter. And if, maybe there's a descending trend, but the descending trend just depends on the single point to the left of the graph. I guess this is where it's still in this room. And on the window, still. So. Yeah. Okay. So I guess I can point this out. So, but the descending trend just depends on a single point. And I'll show you more at the very end, more data. It just came out, I mean, 10 minutes ago, but it just came out on archive last week about this. But if I look at this, this isn't a single uh, supernova remnant. It's smoothly expanding. All I had was this set of line. Yeah, sure, it's a supernova remnant expanding, big center. But there's a lot of random fluctuation. That's not a smoothly expanding supernova remnant. So the first thought is, well, there are filaments in the supernova remnant. And look at the Crab Nebula, it's all, fil all filaments, full of filaments. Um, and so maybe they move horizontally across the line of sight. Okay, well, that's you know easy to say. It doesn't really explain anything. I think it's it explains why it doesn't do anything simple. It doesn't explain what's actually going on. How much NH do you need to do? Sorry? How much column density do you need to get in the... Well, it's about um, 40 uh, parsecs per cubic centimeter or about 10 to the uh, 20 per electrons per square centimeter. It's not totally crazy for filaments in super remnant today. But you'll see some things at the very end about that. Okay, but then we also discover that so this, the rotation measure, that's the integral of the line of sight of the magnetic compound of the magnetic field times the electron density as it rotates the plane of polarization of linearly polarized light, light, yeah, well, light in this case, radio waves, um, as not only varied by quite a bit. But and this is all over a little less than a year, but they even changed sign. Really only once. Well, I'll show you more from this later. But this is really only, um, well, you can see how recent this paper is. Um, came out last week, 10 days ago. Um, and, but you see, it's even changed sign. So this is clearly something very disordered. It's not a smooth structure that's just gradually expanding. You know, there's the definition of rotation measure. Aside from the physical constants. So if it is filaments, they must have opposite directions of compound of magnetic field along the line of sight. Okay, let's try to estimate the magnetic field, not about this one, but about the first repeater to be discovered and the one in which except there's been the most data, or at least maybe it's more recently. And this has been observed where you can see it's was first discovered in 2012, so it's been observed for nearly 10 years which tells you already something about the lifetime of this object that will be able to live at least 10 years, probably more because there's no obvious trend in its property. 
Okay, well, you can define a density weighted average magnetic field. It's simply the ratio of the rotation measure to the dispersion measure. This is the integral of B times N along the length, line of sight. This is the integral of N along the line of sight. So it's not necessarily the magnetic field at any point in space. It's a funny weighted average. And if you put in the expressions for these, it's, you know, and put in the physical constants, it's you put in these in astronomical units, that is, um, well, <laughs> um, rotation measure is in uh, radians per square meter. That's meter of wavelength of the light. Radiation dispersion measure is in uh, parsecs per cubic centimeter. I plug in astronomical units and it comes out like this. Okay, well, so, suppose, so how, what, how do you know what, these, what the magnetic field in the fluctuating region is and how do you know what the dispersion measure in the fluctuating region is? Remember, most of the dispersion measure is probably intergalactic. Well, the intergalactic plasma is not going to contribute to the rotation measure because the rotation measure is quadratic in small quantities, B and N. So how do you separate out the part that's in the, that's rapid, that's near the source and rapidly fluctuating? The only way you can do that is if these things vary and both vary. Okay. Well, the, it was only until 10 days ago, there was only one measurement of a change in dispersion measure at all. All other attempts to measure changes in dispersion measure of repeating just radio bursts came up with nothing. But in this one, which as I said has been observed for nearly a decade, there's one measurement, in the, two measurements, in which there is a change in delta D. And RM changes a lot, so there's, that's not difficult to estimate. If you plug this in, remember this is a funny kind of weighted average. It's not actually the field in any portion of space. You get, you actually have two such about intervals over which you can measure these deltas. And one of them gives you 17 milligauss. The other one gives you three milligauss. Now, you could have, a, if you had a magnetic field that was constant, but large, this wouldn't, it wouldn't give you anything here at all, because this is delta Rm. If it were constant, Rm didn't change. Okay, so this is basic, should be thought of as a lower bound. A 17 milligauss is an, the other measurement gives you 3 milligauss. Again, the lower bounds. Um, that's an extraordinarily large magnetic field by astronomical standards. The interstellar medium in our galaxy has magnetic fields of a few microgauss. Typically, people talk about Okay, well, this is now an obsolete statement, as you'll see later, but I prepared these graphs for five weeks ago, right? except for, well, except I showed you something already that's more recent. Um, but this actually is in a paper that came out sometime in the last year. Um, but there's a, evidence of these really extraordinary fields, which tells you a compact region with high energy density. Um, it's not just high electron density, although that will tend to go with high magnetic Energy, magnetic fields because they both go with high energy density. Um, but that's certainly an extraordinary region. If you ask what's the field, what's the field on the Crab Nebula, it's fractions of milligrams. Much larger than general interstellar fields, fractions of milligrams. Okay, well, this is one that was a much more recent discovery and has rapid fluctuations. And as I showed you a while back, the rotation measure reversed. I have no idea where I am in the talk of stuff. So likely is a very, um, oh, okay, this is an obsolete slide. Ah, yeah, it's an obsolete slide because it now does have, sorry, I said I haven't corrected this for the stuff that came out 10 days ago. It does have a measured rotation. Now, okay. So we'll ignore those first few lines. But let's suppose you haven't seen rotation measure because you haven't seen a linear polarization because linear polarization is averaged to zero by interchannel rotation. In other words, suppose the rotation measure is so large that in your, your channels of finite frequency width, it sweeps through many two pi, the linear polarization sweeps through many two pi and cancels and gets zero. 
that can happen. Okay, well, um, and I, I prepared this slide a month ago with a plausible hypothesis. Now, in fact, the rotation measure is measured. But we'll ignore that because just see what we can do in general. Um, suppose you haven't measured the rotation measure. There's another way of measuring the rotation measure is if you have the baseband signal, which means you sam sample the signal many times per one over the frequency of oscillation. So that's, a, that's electronically you know, a great tour de force. So people learn how to do it at radio frequency. And now you have a linearly polarized from a linearly polarized feed, which is typical. You can certainly choose a linear polarized feed. Well, then you have if you have a linearly polarized field and there is some rotation measure, then the signal in that field is going to oscillate because first the um, electric field and the signal signal in two cents. The electric field of, of the radio wave is going to be parallel to the field, and that's going to be perpendicular to the field. So you get nothing. And then it's going to be the op opposite direction, which of course is still aligned with the field, but of opposite sign, because this is baseband, you're measuring electric field, not power. And then it goes, and then it goes as, a, as the measure, as the linearly polarized signal is rotating in, um, in electric field direction, you'll get an oscillatory signal coming from the linearly polarized field, feed. And it'll oscillate with this angular frequency. And um, if you can measure this, if you have baseband data, then, well, here's what it would typically be with typical astronomical values of parameters. This is actually a very large rotation measure. So the signal would oscillate at tens of kilohertz. And this is large, the largest rotation measure measured for anything in astronomy, including fast radio bursts by 10 to the 5. So that would be like, couple of kilohertz, and that's only a mega, not new. So if you have the baseband data, this is a way to get away from the interchannel mixing, intra-channel rotation. And um, the striking signal and directly tells you the ratio of RM to DM, and DM you measure directly independently from the time delay of the, um, as a function of frequency of the signal. Okay, let's think about radiation mechanism. Um, okay, logical radiation mechanism, I've already written this down. Okay, well, here in curvature radiation, we went through this. Oh, I'm going in the right direction. Yeah, okay. So this implies charges, certain values of charges. You can relate the charge that radiates, these are coherent charges, they're not individual electrons. Individual electrons radiate insignificantly. Um, and you can relate the Q to the angular intensity radiated, which of course is what you measure. Okay, so what do you get? Well, for, this is the fast radio burst that's identified with a soft gamma repeater in our galaxy at something like six kiloparsecs. And this is a nominal cosmological fast radio burst. And, okay, so you can plug that in. And so their effective radiating charges are extraordinary. Coulombs, many coulombs at cosmological distance. All right. Well, what that immediately tells you something that the particle energies have to be high because if the particle energies were not high, these coherent charge bunches would tear themselves apart by electrostatic repulsion. Okay, well, not so simple. If the Lorentz factor is higher, then the spectrum extends to a higher um, uh, frequency, namely the cube of the Lorentz factor. And this, you get this extra factor on the left, which reduces the Q by, in fact, it's this ratio of Lorentz factor squared, which is um, could be quite small. But um, now, for the same, same observed flux, the spectrum now extending to higher frequency, we don't know what this factor is. On the other hand, um, if, if the uh, if the gamma of the radiating wave is comparable to the gamma energy of the gamma of the individual particles, that is, the, is what radiates is the wave pattern, not the individual particles, then you can get values of 
the rent factor of 300 for this one in our galaxy and a few thousands of normal cosmological ones, which reduces the Lorentz factor by quite a bit. Um, but it says that we're going from 100 to these values, it comes in squared, so it's a factor of 10 in our galaxy in a thousand, which reduces the problem of electrostatic repulsion. Okay, let's think about these charge bunches. Charge bunches repel electrons. So electrons must have sufficient energy if the charge bunch doesn't tear itself apart. So that's a minimum electron energy. It's the energy in the charge bunch divided by charge times the charge bunch divided by length. That's just electrostatic energy. And if the scale of the charge bunch for the wavelength of observation over 2 pi, which is a spherical, more spherical charge cloud, then we'd get these energies, which is just totally incredible. So in fact, the much pl more plausible explanation is that the size of the charge bunch is very large transverse to the, it's not spherical at all. You spread the charge bunch out perpendicular to the direction of motion. And that reduces the electrostatic repulsion. But still, if the width perpendicular direction of motion is no more than this, then it still radiates coherently because all the various parts give signals projected in the forward direction that are arriving within a fraction of a frequency cycle. Okay, so that reduces the energies to something like this. Um, and it's not impossible. Um, and gamma 2 is this factor that I will, that ratio that I defined a little while ago, which could be well, quite a bit larger than one. But still, the charge sheet must be very thin. In the direction of radiation, it can't be more than lambda bar, or the, or the radiation wouldn't add up coherently. But in the two transverse directions, it can be quite large as um, it's L, which I'm it's the characteristic length. Okay, and, and characteristic length could be as large as the radius of curvature divided by the Lorentz factor, which I've said we're talking about hundreds or thousands. Okay, what about energetics? Okay, well, let's suppose the energy source is magnetostatic. Okay, well, then the energy you can get out is roughly the volume. Um, there's, this is a four thirds pi in here, and you divide by eight pi, and so on and so forth. So you get some factor of motor unity times the magnetic field times delta b squared, because the energy density is b squared, so it's b delta b, and there's a factor of two that got wrapped into there. Um, okay, and that's, um, you can, uh, you can now relate delta B to the radius of curvature and the time scale of emission and length scale, and any of the energy change has to be, energy emitted has to be something like this. So, um, this is quite reasonable in a what's called a magnetar, extremely strongly magnetized um, neutron star, the total magnetostatic energy available can be in this category. So this is quite reasonable and it's consistent with having many repetitions. Okay, next question. Why is no fast radio burst associated with soft gamma repeater 1806, which was observed in, I think, 2004? Okay, that's actually an interesting problem. Um, so, well, first of all, you say, how would anyone know? Since 2004, that was before so fast radio bursts were observed or, or discovered. Well, someone went back and looked at records of a radio telescope looking at completely unrelated things. I forget which radio telescope it was. And there was, and but it was, but the but this source was above the horizon when the fast when the soft gamma repeater, which of course radio telescopes weren't connected with soft gamma repeaters in those days, was even something completely unrelated, was observing. So it was above the horizon. In fact, it was 35 and a half degrees away from where the radio telescope was pointing. Okay, but radio tele all telescopes have side lobes which means they accept some radiation that's outside the beam. Um, in the case of 
visible light telescopes, you worry about light scattering off the um, struts that hold up the secondary reflector or something. In the case of radio telescopes, it's we get that too if there's a secondary reflector, it usually is. But you also get diffraction from the edge of the dish. So a real telescope has a beam pattern, which is not what you find in the optics textbooks, which gives you an area function. It's got some sensitivity outside the main beam, typically down by 50 or 60 decibels. All right, well, that sounds like a lot, but wait a second. This thing is in our galaxy at a distance like 10 kiloparsecs. Most fast radio bursts are cosmological distances of one to three gigaparsecs, which is 0.3 to one. So between kiloparsecs and gigaparsecs is six orders of magnitude. Well, it's more kiloparsecs than fewer gigaparsecs, so it's five orders of magnitude, which means, or five and a half orders of magnitude, which means that if an ordinary fast radio burst were associated with this soft gamma repeater, the simple proximity should have made it brighter by about 11 orders of magnitude, 110 decibels. Well, it's not in the beam, okay? But the, but the, but the outer beam sensitivity is down from the in beam sensitivity by maybe 60 decibels. So it should have been 50 decibels brighter than a typical cosmological fast radio burst as actually observed. 50 decibels brighter, well, your first reaction is, hey, wait a second, these people sort of, you know, they just saturate the receiver and they, and they ignored the data. And they, you ask the people who made the observation, no, there was no shutoff because the receiver was saturated. So there clearly wasn't a fast radio burst associated with this thing. As I said, it's 100,000 times or 300,000 times closer than the cosmological one. And we know how far away this is. So they're sitting in a supernova remnant in our galaxy that's studied by all the conventional methods of astronomy. Okay, well, there's an explanation. Okay, the second explanation, oh, the fast radio burst just doesn't point towards, towards us, is very narrowly collimated and more outside its beam, requires that its beam is, doesn't have side lobes at the 50 decibel down level, which is conceivable. But there's actually a, a, a more basic explanation. This thing gave off about 10 to the 47 ergs per second in soft gamma rays. Well, if you put that much energy into a neutron star magnetosphere, it fills with equilibrium pair plasma. Because, because there are it doesn't really matter how you put the energy in, because there are processes that turn two particles into three, namely three photon pair annihilation, namely radiative Compton scattering, which is a Compton scattering and an additional photon is emitted. And they're down from the principal processes by one power of the fine structure content. That's only two orders of magnitude. So if you put enough energy into a magnetosphere or any region of space, it fills with equilibrium pair photon plasma. Thermodynamic equilibrium at temperatures of probably hundreds of kilovolts, this much energy. And in fact, there's a fairly sharp threshold for this, which is interesting. The point is, if you fill the space with equilibrium pair photon plasma, which means a million grams per centimeter of pairs and of rest energy corresponding to the photons, um, then if you're not going to accelerate relativistic particles, you're not going to propagate radio radiation. Okay, so let me finish up with um, things that were discovered, reported. Um, well, you can see, this was a little bit earlier this month. Okay. So actually, I already showed the bottom part of this. And here's a fast radio burst, which was repeater, which was discovered, um, well, you can see, 1905-20, so a couple of years, ago, almost three years ago. A lot more data. And we'll see if we've got the latest version of the talk. So here are measurements of dispersion measure versus time. This is over almost a year, March 21 to January this year. And two different instruments, uh, Green Bank and Parks, mostly these are from Parks. So of course, they're scattered in time because you know sometimes you're observing time, sometimes you don't, sometimes the repeater's active and sometimes it isn't. 
So here we see, oh, here I already showed you that the magnetic field has reversed, that really is based on this one measurement, but that tells you that the environment around the thing is very dynamic, that it reorganizes itself totally on a time scale of a year, or six months actually, eight months, and actually possibly a much shorter time scale. Um, and this is circular polarization, and with error bars of data, I don't know to say about it. Now, here's the dispersion measure. And what I really want to call your attention to, this vertical stripe is actually, although you can't really tell from this graph, is all within a single day. I mean, it's all within a few hours because um, it seems to move across the sky. You can observe them sometimes for five hours. You can't observe them for 24 hours. And you see the dispersion measure is jumping around. And if the last slides made it into the talk, we'll see. By, okay, it's about 40 parsecs per cubic centimeter, or 10 to the 20 electrons per square centimeter, um, within these few hours. And jumping around turns out the really interesting consequences um, on a very a much shorter time scale than that. Now, this is revolutionary in this business because until a couple of years ago, no one had observed any change in dispersion measure. And then when I told you a few slides ago about the estimate of 17 milligauss for a different source, different repeater, that was based on actually two changes in dispersion measure. That was based, the 17 milligauss was based on one change from two, between two epochs. And there was another number of three milligauss based on another such change. But that was all there was. Here we have, it turns out, um, this, the, this paper had uh, reported 113 bursts, of which 68 were in one observing session some night, day, it doesn't have to be one, it's one several hour period. Um, and you can see that the dispersion measure measurements, whose accuracy is such that the error bars would be invisible, um, smaller than the symbols, uh, are scattered. So it varies very rapidly, and I hope we have some more data. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. So this app was added to the latest version of the talk because I didn't know about this a month ago because this was only reported 10 days ago. Okay. So what we have here, if I've if I plotted, I told you in one observing session, um, they've observed 68 bursts and that means there's 67 intervals. They're not 67 points in this graph because some of them are also the right hand side. Is most of them. Okay. So here we have change in dispersion measure in the standard units, and although the full range is 40, the actual different none of the differences between one event and the next exceed 30. And as a function of time, and since I was sitting there um, going through these, and the, and the original reported in terms of Julian days rather than seconds, I left it in days. Um, but there are 100,000, 86,400, we call it 100,000 seconds in a day. So 10 to the minus three um, days is 86.4 seconds. Okay, so I plotted these points, except some. And what you see is there's no correlation. In other words, you're as likely to have a large change in dispersion measure, 10 or even 20, between bursts that are tens of seconds apart as between bursts that are some out there, hours apart, or at least many minutes apart, or observing sessions, a few hours. So, um, okay. So let me point out a couple of really weird points. Okay, down here is one dot. There are actually two points. What would be the error bars? on the y-axis, are they showing? very, okay, the error, oh yeah, the error bars on the y-axis are typically a few tenths. Okay. So if one were to plot them, and of course there are two of them, so you know, throw in the square root two, like they teach you in freshman physics, it'd be bare, the error bars be barely bigger than the points. Yeah, no, it's a good, good question. Should have put one error bar in. Um, it's just done rather hastily. Okay. Um, so, you can see that there's no correlation. So it tells you if there's a natural time scale, it's shorter than the shortest such interval, which tells you that there's this local region that has contributes 30, 20 or 30 or 40 parsecs per cubic centimeter is chaotic 
on a very short time scale. It's rearranging itself. How short a time scale? Okay, so let me talk about these points over here. This point is actually two points, zero and zero. No change in dm, same time to a tiny fraction of, of, of a width of a point on the graph. Those are probably not separate bursts. Those are probably um, substructure of individual bursts. So it doesn't play any. Then there's a point over here where that does appear, nominally appear to have a measured difference in dm. It's 2.8 plus or minus plus or minus 0.6, if I remember correctly. Each of them is 0.4. So and now if that's the case, then those two bursts are separated by 35 milliseconds. Well, that would be extraordinary. But you know, one worries about that. One suspects this is really substructure of an individual burst and somehow by the fitting routine fitted slightly different dispersion measures to the two sort of substructure. So you probably should ignore that point. Okay. But if you look at points like this and this, they're separated by as little as nine seconds. I think that's this one. Uh, 10 to the minus four days. And there's a couple more that are separated by slightly more. So that tells you that there's no, that this is an upper bound on the characteristic time scale of what's going on in this region. Um, and that is truly extraordinary. This region, which contributes a quite significant amount of dispersion measure, um, completely rearranges itself in time scales of order 10 seconds. That means it's got to be small. Is that different regions? Sorry? Is that different regions? I don't quite understand. So they're not different regions, we say the one. Well, you could is... imagine a different hypothesis is that the, what we call FRB, whatever it is, has multiple regions that radiate independently. And, our, and this one goes off, and then that one goes off. And that is not excluded empirically. But if you think about any conceivable model, you have some active object, a neutron star, black hole, and stuff swirling around it. And it's hard to imagine that a single identified fast radio burst has several independent such objects. It's not explicitly excluded empirically, but it'd be very hard to understand. Okay, time scale. Well, suppose you have a region of size r. What I really like to do is constrain the mass. So this is a general expression. This is just, you know, Kepler orbit, although flip, 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 fly down, um, assuming it's gravitationally bound. Um, okay, well, that's a characteristic time scale. Can we estimate R? Because you could estimate R, we know what T is. We know that T is no more than a order 10 seconds. Uh, then we'd get GM. Okay, but how do we know what R is? We can't directly determine it. If we knew how fast things could move, we'd have a number, but that would, you could simply, if you, if that, you wouldn't be adding new information by saying R, V is R over T, because you don't know what V is. Okay, but maybe we will someday. It turns out when you put in the numbers that the density required, remember, we know how much the dispersion measure is changing. Um, the density required is high enough that the dispersion may not strictly follow the one over omega squared that you're used to, because that's really only the first term in an expansion of powers of one over omega squared. If you could measure the next term, then you would know by comparing the, the omega minus two term to the omega minus four term, they're only the even power. Um, then you'd be able to estimate the ratio of the plasma frequency to the observing frequency. And from that, you'd know the electron density. And then from the no measured DM, if you could estimate any, you'd get all. Okay. Um, that would be very interesting because what I'd like to do is to measure the mass. In other words, my pet hypothesis is that these things, repeating fast radio bursts, are in fact produced by accretion disks around massive intermediate mass probably black holes, as opposed to neutron star magnetospheres. There are lots of reasons, which I actually didn't make it into this talk, why the problem with the neutron star magnetosphere hypothesis for repeating fast radio bursts. And the basic reason is there's no periodicity in, in, in repeating fast radio bursts. And 
this is another paper I didn't somehow I never didn't make it into this talk. Um, maybe because the paper hadn't been written when I first prepared the talk. Prepared the first version of the talk. But there are very strict bounds on periodicity. And if you have a rotating magnetic field, it doesn't have to be a what they call a magnetar, but that's a plausible explanation. That just simply says extremely big field, bigger than ordinary radio pulsar. Um, then you it's hard to avoid whatever it does being periodic because the magnetic field is rotating. The neutron stars are clearly going to rotate the world in the pulsars. And whatever it does is going to be in some way parallel to the magnetic field. And unless you have a almost exactly dipole field, almost exactly aligned with the rotation axis, whatever this pad is, is going to have a pattern that's going to go around, rotate at the rotation period. And there are very strict bounds on a paper, which I wrote after preparing the first solutions as well. Um, there are very strict bounds in any such periodicity. It just people keep on looking for it and the data. Now that there are more than a thousand bursts from now two fast radio bursts, they're very strict bounds. So maybe M is large, I'd like to get a lower band. Okay, that's basically the talk. Um, so and the telephone would left. That's me. it. But it was very interesting. Yeah. I wish I could see the last slides. Maybe you can. This is the last slide. Oh. This is the end of the talk. But isn't that like an intermediate black hole conclusion? Well, no, because we don't yet have a lower bound on mass. That's a, that's my pet theoretical idea. I can't prove it. Maybe we will be able to at some point. I hope this leads to that. At the moment, I can't. So it might be wrong. Probably wrong. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, what if you go backwards from the, the mass, intermediate mass, black hole hy hypothesis, what would be the constraints on the other parameters that you would want from the observations? You know, assume that intermediate mass is correct. Yeah. What are what are the observations you need to have? Yeah, yeah. Well, other quantities if you can estimate T, this would be the way to test it. The moment we don't have the information, it's consistent in it, but we don't know, we don't have independent bound on R. We have a bound on NR, but we don't, but we don't have N, R and N separately. The higher order term and the dispersion relation could give you N, if it can be measured, which would not be easy to do even if it's there. So we have a question from Jim Buckley. Jim, I'll ask you to speak loudly so we can hear you. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, I was just wondering, um, and maybe Yaji and Alex, <laughs> I don't know if they might ask this question, what about, you know, well outside of the light cylinder of a pulsar or a magnetar in a current sheet, uh, have you thought about whether densities, time scales, uh, lack of periodicity uh, well, could be satisfied? It could be periodic. There's a popular model I know, of that yeah, radio yeah. burst that involves a collimated beam from a neutron star of some sort going out into a supernova remnant and having some magic plasma physics and making a fast radio burst. But the point is that beam is still going to be sweeping around with the rotation of the neutron star. So the result will still be periodic, even, though, even if the radiation is emitted enormously far from the neutron star itself. Well, what about all these small regions, like, like Henrik's question, what if there were multiple small regions and maybe they were lit up at the same time by some type of flashlight effect or something, more or less, an, a well, disturbance that lights them up? Is tied to a rotating neutron star. Right, right, yeah. but it only, when it, only when it moves through a, an object. Well, it can be periodically modulated is the point. No, I get what you're, Sometimes I totally get what you're saying. Flashlight doesn't hit yeah. a mirror or whatever you want to call it. You're not going to get anything at all. Okay. But anyway. The flashlight's motion is still periodic. Do you know so about you get the a convolution of the periodic motion of the flashlight and the structure around it, which is chaotic in some way? Uh, that doesn't wipe out the periodicity. And I just have no feeling for this, but integrating along the line of sight through the current sheet, do dispersion mem uh, measures or um, or uh, oh, rotation the only thing measures. The significant dispersion are, are non relativistic electrons. 
Once they're moving right. relativistically, they respond very little to the electromagnetic wave because of the mm -hmm. relativistic increase in effective mass. And so they don't give you dispersion. Dispersion has to come from non-relativistic electrons. Right, right. Anyways, yeah, I can talk to you more later. It's interesting. More questions? Anyone in the room? So remember we get what's the total number of repeating FRBs we have now? Total number, well, not not the repetitions themselves, but the total number of individual sources. There are a little over 20 known repeaters. And which two of which have each been observed to have more than a thousand repetitions. That's just a matter of, of probably just a matter of application of observational resources. Um, there are several hundred apparent non repeaters in, in the I think it's still in three best digits now. So we have another question from the from Zoom. Uh, so Alex, yeah, and I'll ask you to speak loudly because it's hard to hear. Alex, we don't hear you at all if you are speaking. Hello, can you can you hear me now? Now, now, now it's good. Okay. Um, I have. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have uh, one comment and one question. Um, so for the comment, I think the SGR you were talking about, that was a giant flare. That was not the soft gamma ray repeater. That's not the repeating repeater that we usually talk about. The repeaters are usually uh, a much lower energy, right? Those are like 10 to the I was 40. referring to the giant flare from a soft gamma repeater, yes. I see, I see. Okay, yes. So yeah, I totally agree that the giant flares are Definitely completely thermalized, but the, the lower the, the the bursts, the X-ray bursts are probably not because they are much There's lower. No direct energy. evidence for their smaller outbursts. That's true. And yes. in fact, if you go back to this fast radio burst at the center of our galaxy, not the center, excuse me, within our galaxy, not the center. Um, that's an interesting that actually repeated a couple of times at much lower intensity we're talking radio waves, then it's big eruption. But the big eruption was correlated with an X-ray outburst, not an X-ray or soft gamma ray outburst like 1806 minus 20, like the giant ones, but a smaller one. And that supports a model for, for the apparent non-repeaters as being produced by something like soft gamma repeaters, not their super giant um, VF, not their super giant outbursts of 10 to the 47 Earth, but lesser outbursts of let's say 10 to the 43 Earth, where the argument of filling space with an equilibrium pair plasma does not apply. And in fact, there's a statistical argument in favor of that. This, is, this argument has to do with outliers, ratio of brightest to second brightest. And wrote a paper on that in general, but I was thinking about this. And for most astronomical objects, whether it's individual outbursts of the same object or different members of a class, the ratio of the brightest to the second brightest is comparatively small, less than 10. And that's consistent with smooth, typically power law, it doesn't have to be power law, distributions of event sizes. But for soft gamma repeaters, that ratio is not a few or 10, that ratio is several orders of magnitude, which tells you that the extreme outbursts are in the outliers, as they call them, are intrinsically different from the small outbursts. They're not an extrapolation of a power law distribution or any other smooth distribution. And that is true of this soft gamma repeater in our galaxy. It had a giant outburst of millions of Janskis and two smaller outbursts of about 100 Janskis. So the ratio there is more than 10,000. And that's an interesting characteristic and nothing to do with physics, it's purely statistical, that these are objects, soft gamma repeaters and this, this fast radio burst in our galaxy, in which the outliers are qualitatively different from the lesser members, lesser events. And that's certainly a strong reason to believe, very qualitative reason, but a strong reason to believe that the apparent non-repeaters are like 
the uh, are like two things, like the fast radio burst in our galaxy, which isn't quite bright enough to have been at cosmological to be detected at cosmological distances, but if we're at intermediate distance, you'd certainly call it an apparent non-repeater. But that they're also like soft gamma repeaters, and that these are all classes of objects that have extreme outliers whose distribution of event sizes is not smooth, whose ratio of brightest to second brightest is several orders of magnitude rather than something in the range one to ten. It's a very qualitative argument, but it's but it's striking because when I made a list of outliers, I said, you know, when are outliers different? Something like the title of the paper. Um, it turns out that for almost all distribution astronomical objects, the outliers do not appear to be qualitatively different. You know, some of the obvious things like the brightness of the, you know, the stars in the, in the sky, or the active galactic nuclei, and so on. And they're all statistically consistent with being part of the same distribution, which has obviously got to be for storms in the sky. Um, but there are a few, pro the only, pro in fact, classes of events where this is not the case, um, they have to be repeating events for it to be meaningful at all, are soft gamma repeaters, apparently non-repeating fast radio bursts, or well, they're really only one where there's a second event, and that's the one in our galaxy. And that strongly suggests that, that they're, these are connected. So I, I had a question. So how, how much do you, so you said that these fast changes in the dispersion measurement they only happen for one relatively distant FRB. They've they only, only been have been measured, measured for yeah, this they, one. Yes. So how much do you read into this? Because the, the the dispersion measure change could be happening anywhere on the line of sight. Not rapidly. Remember, if it's occurring in tens of seconds, that graph went from zero to yeah. about a minute. It's what well, it could be anywhere on the line of sight. That's created by physics. But the idea that you would have a parsec away, a region, um, 100 light seconds across is chaotically varying, but if it's a parsec away, you know, how could it be connected with the source? So the only plausible interpretation is that it is closely connected to the source. Either the source is in the middle of it or on one side of it. Um, the idea of running into something like that accidentally along those line of sight, that's two miracles. It reminded me of micro lensing, so I wonder. But it, first of all, dispersion measure is not intensive, no, 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 so yeah, it yeah. cannot be microlensing. And the point about microlensing is you search an enormous number of objects whose lines of sight each pass an enormous number of masses. Mm -hmm. And microlensing is a very small effect; it just happens to be focusing, which is why it's observable. Um, here, you, here it's got to be associated with a single source. So it has to be local to that source. That's the only plausible interpretation. What you said, it has to be this very thin pancake that it is. Oh, that was in the radiation process, and that was to avoid excessive electrostatic repulsion of the electrons that are in this charge bunch. Because that's little completely little unrelated to the conversation we were just having. But it's a little pancake, and it's got to be a pancake to, really, to make the electrostatic repulsion. But each one has a different location measure? No, 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 no. That's a single fast radio burst. There's no connection between that and this conversation about the fluctuations. But don't they have to go together? You have the same pancake and some of the rotation measure changes. Yes, yeah, but this pancake is occurring within a neutron star magnetosphere. Dimensions 10 to the 6 centimeters. The rotation measure is coming from some surrounding stuff, which might be a supernova remnant of parsec across. Let's say 12 orders of magnitude bigger. It might be a dense cloud. 10 to the 10 centimeters, that's pretty small astronomically, it's still four orders of magnitude bigger. So oh, they're connected. Completely different connection, completely different length scale. So in other words, as far as the dispersion measure and rotation measure are concerned, the actual radiation mechanism is, a, is from a point. Now, I was looking at what goes on inside that not quite point. It comes from one pancake, but then you have different regions in the... Oh, but you no, know, but the, this pancake I'm talking about is relativistic particles moving towards us, on the scale of a neutron star magnetosphere. The dispersion rotation measure is occurring even at the tightest on scales of 10 to the 10 centimeters, so thousands of times greater in a non-relativistic plasma. 
still don't understand this. Is how you, how you well, you'll have a compact source. Yes. The pancake is, remember I said the radius of curvature divided by the Lorentz factor. So the pancake is 10 to the 4 centimeters wide. You know, 100 meters, maybe less. Okay. And it's moving on a radius of curvature of 10 kilometers. So, a, so that's effect from the point of view of 10 to the 10 centimeters, that's a point source. And then on the time scale, on the scale of 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 11 centimeters, it's being, re, it's being dispersed and its polarization is being changed by a non-relativistic plasma. Whose, yeah. whose dimension is once, several orders of magnitude bigger. That once and one of it, or how do you get the different plasma at different times? Oh, well, that's re, that 10 to the 10 centimeter stuff is rearranging itself on time scales of many seconds. Which time scale is it? Sorry? Seconds. 10 seconds or less, right? Well, well yeah, yeah, because, yeah, 10 seconds or less because the dispersion measure varies, we know, in 10 seconds. Seems you're more likely that it somehow something is moving relative to each other rather than stuff we arranging so quickly. Well, but it, this, this, this is a fairly energetic event, therefore it must be tied to a mass. Maybe a neutron star, maybe a black hole. And so that's, you know, sets your frame of reference. And then the dispersion has to be occurring, produced by non-relativistic electrons. And how big is that region? In which it's occurring well we know it's decorrelated on time scale of 10 seconds so it can't be more than 10 light seconds and it's probably one or two orders of magnitude less but it's still very large compared to this relativistic pancake that's actually making the radiation which is 100 meters across more or less unless you have some light out effect something kind of sweeps and illuminates it well, but it's still got to come to us yeah. in order for us to observe it. Just the question is, are Q to by the GM? Well, this is just kept, you know, Kepler's law. I flipped it over. So, and I simply said that the time, if this is this region in which the dispersion measure is varied, what's the characteristic time of that region if it is gravitationally bound? This is just dimensional analysis. It's the frequency of a, the period divided by two pi of a Kepler orbit. And so we'd have a bound on that. If we could measure that, we would have a bound or a value for M, which would really be very nice. That could tell us if the intermediate black hole is right or wrong. And so we don't yet have a bound on M. Or we have NR that's directly measured. We don't have them separately, and I was suggesting the higher order term in the plasma dispersion expression as a way to determine n. And it turns out that that if you try to, if you okay, r is already constrained simply by these ten seconds, and that tells you that, and given this, that n is got is got to be at least something like ten to the ten. Turns out that the critical plasma frequency at the rate at the frequency of observation was three gigahertz, so that tends to be eleven. So, in other words, if the plasma density is any higher than that, the rate, the waves just don't go through, just don't go through it at all. So, you are within striking range of the of the region in which the in which you have to consider the higher order terms in the electron density, and which means there's some hope of measuring those higher orders. Or at least detecting. And that's, you know, that would require a very careful analysis of the dispersion, which these people haven't looked for. Um, you know, they just report this, the results that came out of their fitting, um, but they should look for it because it might be there. So you mentioned intermediate mass black holes, and you said on, the, on your first seminar on this that because we don't see any or we don't typically see FRBs in our galaxy they need to be rare objects yes but I guess it could also be that they're the life cycle of the object that's emitting the FRBs is very short well rare means rare at any given time yeah exactly so what what would be the scenario in your mind where an intermittent mass black hole could explain okay well of course 
No one it's... ever understands the plasma physics of these things. 55 years after the discovery, no one knows why pulsars give pulses. Um, so I would speculate that you have an accretion disk and funnel around these, these things. And perhaps they're in binary stars. You have a binary companion, which you know, stellar mass black holes have, are detected when they have accretion of binary companion. People talk about stars being captured by supermassive black holes in AGN, somewhere in between on the mass scale. And that in some mysterious way, that's pleasant as it's for you, the accretion flow uh, produces metastatic instability. I have, I have words, I'm not getting any content, um, that accelerates particles that radiate um, coherent, probably by curvature radiation. It's hard to get synchrotron radiation at a lower frequency. Uh, curvature radiation is false. It's got to be coherent because the brightness temperature is incredible, just like pulsars. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's lambda over pi over one. So that would be like 10 centimeters. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm so sure that's <laughs> it seems kind of. Well, so so okay, that's a plasma <laughs> physics question, but the fact that coherent radiation is observed at frequencies of, well, mm -hmm. now it's actually from 100. 100 megahertz up to about 8 gigahertz tells you that you must have bunching on that scale. So what was the width of the pancake? Okay, so the width of the pancake can be as large as the radius of curvature divided by the Lorentz factor, which if it's a neutron star magnetosphere is could be 10 to the 4 centimeters. If we're, um, uh, if it's some plasma instability in an accretion funnel around the intermediate black hole, we don't have a natural scale. We know what the Schwarzschild radius is, but of course the instability could be occurring on a much smaller scale. It doesn't have to be the equivalent of the radius of the immediate here. So it could be a couple of orders of magnitude. That's kind of a lot. Sorry? It's kind of odd to have that extremely thin pancake. <laughs> Well, the only way to, re to avoid having it as a selection effect, the only way to avoid having it torn apart by electrostatic repulsion is to have it in that same pancake, which all the parts of this pancake are radiating coherently as observed by the observer, but they're far apart from each other, so the electrostatic repulsion is less. So you can say if it weren't in such a pancake, it would tear itself apart and you wouldn't see the radiation. That pancake perpendicular, perpendicular to us, yeah. Because the point is, it's got to be thin along the line of sight so that the fields add coherently. But it can be wide in the transverse direction, and the fields will still add coherently. Because everything's emitted towards us. The ones that aren't moving towards us, we don't see, because they don't radiate in our direction. Somebody else sees them. So then, if that were the case, wouldn't we see less fast radio bursts sometimes? When the pancake is not aligned well, that's, towards us, but yeah, they be, yeah, but they'd be, much, they'd be much less luminous. So there's a strong selection effect. I remind you of the classical thing goes back to the '60s. Why do um, you assume equipartition between uh, between magnetic fields and particle energies in a radio source, AGN, you know, a double radio source? Why be why do you assume the energy is equal equipartition? Because for a given amount of energy. The amount of power radiated is a maximum if you're close to equipartition. So by selection, those are the ones you see. The ones in which the particle energy is much less than the magnetic energy, or the particle energy, or the magnetic energy is much less than the particle energy, are very inefficient producers of radiation. And so selection says that you see the ones in which those are comparable. So within a class of objects, you're going to see the ones that make the strongest signal. Unless um, one takes beaming into account, like we see way out of equipartition emission from AGN jets, but it may have to do with what dominates the you know jet collimation mechanism. Is it field or is it I don't know? But, but kinetic those are energy. coherent. They're yeah. non-thermal. Right, but right, not coherent. right. They're not coherent emission. And right. one other question, I'm just you're so good at this kind of dimensional analysis. If you plug in your electron density, your physical scale, 
and your magnetic field, is that consistent with magnetic reconnection or, you know, is kind of, you know, I, I, I think that's a tough, a tough one, but can't you do some sort of dimensional there's analysis? No, there's no predictive theory of magnetic reconnection. No, no, but, but they're kind of, that's why it's a good dimensional analysis <laughs> exercise. Well, no, but dimensional analysis isn't sufficient to solve that. So it's certainly yeah. consistent, it's yeah. plausible. Mm -hmm. There's no detailed theory. Yeah, well, okay. I mean, this is something we could also see from the, uh, from, I mean, we're getting closer with simulations to, to be able to, to see this um, um, that is important input. Sorry? What do you mean there's no theory? It, well, the, you know, you can, brought, you can do, there's no first principles theory that will enable you to predict magnetic reconnection or, or the properties of the radiation it produces. Well, yeah. oh, people do these tick calculations, but the, you know, the, the numbers of particles and so on are many orders of magnitude removed from anything that you observe in astrophysics, even in, this, even in the solar system. And you don't know the initial conditions in an astronomical object. Even if your computational ability were perfect, you don't know the initial conditions. Problem of a great many things in astrophysics. That applies by any of what you're talking about. Absolutely. So you have to say, this is observed, what could it be? I have no predictive ability. If no one had, if people knew and thought about neutron stars, rotating magnetic neutron stars, no one would have predicted radio pulsars. So if it's not a connection, what else would it be? Well, I can't think of what else it could be, but that doesn't mean I, got, I understand it. And, but none of those other possibilities have a better theory. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, if you didn't, well, this is not astronomy, but if you didn't know that there were thunderstorms, you never would have predicted them. Isn't there also an Eddington-like argument that you put put that much power into a small region and it's going <laughs> to blow itself apart? It's um, uh, is that something also worth thinking about? Like, uh, well, if you're talking about a magnetosphere, then it can be mm -hmm. quite. Magnetic field can be tightly bound to this very massive object underneath. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't tear itself apart. But you will be worried, that's what I was doing some numbers on, about the charge bunches. Sure. The charge bunches do electrostatically repel each other. And, right. And this is all because you're trying to get coherent curvature radiation? Is that, is that well, what you're drives trying, that? Yeah, because that's well, you're trying because that's what you... explanation of what you see. Yeah. I mean, what about... Uh, um, so I think in your first lecture, you made the point that it just doesn't look like anything like typical incoherent synchrotron broadband it emission, be right? Coherent because yeah. the brightness yeah. temperature is right, right, right. Degrees. So you argued for coherent. What about, um, <laughs> I hate to raise this, but what about a, a some sort of mechanism that, uh, where you input kind of a delta function in radio frequency, like a line of some sort, say at the rest mass of an axion. <laughs> well, if you can come up with a coherent source, <laughs> you know, I mean, sure, 21 centimeter radiation is definitely well, coherent and it's a line. Excuse me, it's not coherent. It's definitely a line, but it's mm -hmm. not a high brightness temperature coherent source. It's limited to the spin temperature of the electrons or the hyperfine space at a hyperfine structure. Well, that's obviously not relevant. Um, if you have Lasers. energetic particles, they naturally produce a brightness temperature, which is their energy, you know, divided by the Boltzmann constant. In order well, to get, do better than that, and this is 10 to the 35 degrees or 10 to the 31 volts, you need to have coherent emission. You cannot right. make 10 to the 31 volt electrons. So, so maybe a synchrotron maser or an axion. I mean, what, you know, just you playing devil's advocate. Mazers, but if you think about that for a moment, all that is, is a coherent bunch. In that mm -hmm. case, it's synchrotron, not curvature. It's mm -hmm. hard to get synchrotron radiation down on a radio frequency in a region of high magnetic field, mm -hmm. like you're mm -hmm. thinking about a magnetic neutron mm -hmm. star. That's why one thinks of curvature radiation. Because mm -hmm. synchrotron radiation in the neutron star magnetic field is X-rays or gamma rays, not radio waves. How do you get the 
Well, you have an accelerating electric field, and, and actually, special relativistically, each accelerated bunch tends to move down the cavity. Inside the light cylinder, no, somewhere else. Very likely in the inner magnetosphere, or very plausibly in the inner magnetosphere. What, why would that produce a particular Just because we Well, that has a sele selection effect. If it's not perpendicular to us, and the radiation is not in our direction, and we wouldn't see it. Someone else would see it, be perpendicular to that observer. Can it also to move to us? Well, it's got to be moving along the line of sight, or we won't be in its radiation pattern. If it's along moving in somebody else's direction, then it's that other observer's radiation pattern. Averaged over the whole thing, it's you know over all possible directions of over time, probably all observers are roughly equally likely to see it. They see it when there's a pancake moving in their direction. And is it moving in a, like following a curved magnetic field line? I mean, well, that's what has to assume that what you're seeing is curvature radiation. Yes. And you only... You only see it when it's pointing when towards it's you the because time, relativistic yeah. emission is beamed. Yeah. And other times it's pointing to some other observer and that other observer sees it. But you don't think it's intrinsically anisotropic. I mean, the radiation is anisotropic, right. but the source itself, you're not... The source itself, average over all the radiation that ever emits, is probably roughly isotropic. I mean, you know, if it's a neutron star magnetosphere, they're going to be preferred directions along the magnetic axis of the magnetic axis. But that's sort of an order of unity thing. Yeah. But at any moment, it's radiating in some, beam, in some narrow beam. But over time, those beams will fall over most of the full time. Yeah, but you're not thinking of it like a gamma ray burst, where it is likely beamed along one direction. Well, that's a single event. If you think all the gamma ray bursts in the universe, or all the gamma ray bursts, yeah. or be a, roughly a laser right. source where you have a preferred plane for the amazing happens. Yeah, no, it, 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 this is the burst you see at one time, and some other observer will see, you know, we're not likely to be special. Some other observer will see bursts from the same source, but at different times when they happen to be oriented in his direction. So for these repeaters, what do you think that means about the duty cycle? As okay, far as... the duty cycle is much larger than the duty cycle we see. Um, but at any time, the radiation only illuminates a four, small fraction of four pi, so the instantaneous power is much less and what's called the isotropic equivalent power, which is what you get if you look at the intensity that you see, the dp d omega, and multiply it by four to higher times the square of the distance. Right, but you have to boost it up for the fact that your other observers are seeing it at other times. But that's, right, but right. instantaneously, it's it's, really, it's it's producing much less. Yeah. The all observer duty factor is much larger than the duty factor you see. But um, it's not a four pi. But at any time it's radiating into a tiny fraction of four pi. So you're seeing the right mean power, but during a burst you're seeing a much higher power than the isoc than the total power. We would infer a much higher power than the total power because during a burst, it's emitting narrowly collimated radiation. Now, it may always be emitting that radiation, but usually it's pointing in some other narrow direction. Second, the magnetic field in the pancake is that. Uh, well, it's got to be along the pancake because the charges can only move along the magnetic field. Excuse me, you might say along. It's got to be perpendicular to the pancake, along the axis of the pancake, because Charges can only move along the magnetic field, they can't move transversely. Sorry? Did you have some magnitude of a magnitude? No, you can't, because it's curvature radiation, it's independent of the magnitude of the field, except the field can't be too small. Um, but all it depends on is the radius of curvature of the field. So, how, what would you get? What would well, okay. I, okay, well, guesses. Okay. If it's a neutron star, 
then you get neutron star radius. If it's a intermediate black hole, mass black hole, then you guess the Schwarzschild radius of the intermediate mass black hole. What's the mass? I don't know. Could be anything from stellar masses up to, well, okay, it's not likely to be supermassive because we know that one of them occurred in a globular cluster out in the arms of a galaxy. So it's not the thing that you see at the center of a galaxy. You've got the required magnetic field is functional. Sorry? If you've got the required magnetic field is functional, just the of radius of that. Like how, what, what do you get for a Newton star or intermediate black hole? A required magnetic field depends on what you assume to be energy of the particles. The required magnetic field is very is quite small because it's only sufficient to guide the electrons. So it's orders of magnitude less than typical neutron star magnetic fields. So off the top of my head, I can't tell you if it's 10 to the 6 gauss or 10 to the 8 gauss. But it's not required to be 10 to the 12. But it, isn't there some energy density that goes into like the stress energy tensor that has to be sufficient to resist the it effects be, of it the has to have sufficient stress yeah that it's not torn apart exactly by the exactly yes, i haven't put in the numbers on that but typically make at least if you're talking in terms of neutron stars the the inner magnetospheric fields are many orders of magnitude larger than mm -hmm. would be required for that mm -hmm. yeah i'm just a little bit i just wonder a little bit just the effects of putting I mean, th these are really high, <laughs> large numbers of, uh, you, you know, power per unit uh, volume and and electron densities and charges. And I mean, it seems like a stress analysis as well, you know, a dimensional stress analysis would be interesting. <laughs> well, you, you certainly could do that. And, but if you think, yeah. I can hear you that if you're thinking in terms of, if you're comparing to neutron star, magnetic neutron star magnetic fields, they're much, much less. I haven't actually put in the numbers because it's... Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it seems like the field values you're coming up with, I mean, they actually sound quite a bit like interjet AGN kind of field values. So uh, for whatever reason, I'm not AGN sure. AGN but... fields are much, are much, much less than, neutron, than magnetic neutron star fields. Yeah, yeah, I mean, AGN field, I mean, so the, these numbers of milligauss kind of fields are about well, well that's not the emission region that's along the line of well, sight. that was sorry that was along the line of sight okay yeah 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 i'm confusing yeah, those this. are certainly yeah. interesting yeah and those you know right, maybe right. well uh, my but recollection that's... of agn numbers is kilogauss not milligauss no no the point is uh, that the milligauss is, is large compared to ordinary interstellar if, fields so if you do standards it's a very <laughs> dense region no, it's it's really anomalously small in the emission regions that give you the high energy electrons that give you the synchrotron and inverse Compton and stuff. It's got to be like oh, yeah. well, uh, point a much higher energy density region than this thing along. No, the line. but that's but those but but those are like uh, milligauss kind of or oh. tens of milligauss. I mean, they're not much of a fraction of a gauss ever. I think so. Anyways, I mean that just kind of argues that. That's the right region, but I also kind of wonder why you wouldn't see this if you see it something in an intermediate mass black hole that very occasionally. Do you do you also see it in AGN jets very occasionally, but there are fewer of them or something? Or I mean, what's why wouldn't we see this just in? An AGN too, or is it just a? Uh... Well, that's of course an interesting question. Suppose it is related to accretion disk. Why don't we see something like this in stellar mass black holes with accretion disks? Mm -hmm. Exist. We see them as right, actual... right, in both extremes. Yeah, yeah, which are supermassive black holes with accretion disks. Um, and I sort of have two explanations. One is that the Stellar mass black holes that we see are very luminous. The supermassive black holes that we see in AGN are very luminous. That means in both cases, there's a large flux of thermal photons that will interact with any electrons you try to accelerate by constant scattering mm -hmm. and will take energy away from those accelerated electrons right. and they're being accelerated. Right, you hostile environments for accelerating high energy particles. Yeah, that's true. And the other argument is 
that's, you know, so these have to be compared to the luminosity intermediate mass black hole. The other argument is simply selection effect. When you look for fast radio bursts, you are looking for the object for the objects that are particularly bright emitters of radio waves. When you look for visible light at the center of galaxies, you're looking for the objects that are particularly bright emitters of mostly thermal, some non-thermal, visible light. If you look at binary stellar mass black holes, you're looking for bright emitters of thermal x-rays. And so it can simply be that the two different kinds of observations, rather naturally, each tend to pick out the objects that are brightest in their band of observation. And so it could simply be at that observational selection. So these are good constraints for coherent emission and rotation measures. That wouldn't be the next step to say, look, it could be either neutral stars or black holes, or for each of these scenarios to come up with a platoon where you can get your pancake. Um, yeah, well, something like the pancake probably is, is considered by people who talk about radio emission from pulsars because they have the same problem. They need coherent emission. Yeah, I I think I kind of get what Henrik's saying. Couldn't. Could, even if it's not proven to be the correct answer, wouldn't it be nice to construct one detailed scenario that does what you want? Like, you know, for example, through simulations and so on. It feels like, you know, like building one, if I'm not sure if that's what Henrik's saying, but building yeah. one, yeah. one working model would be nice. Come up with some toy models, basically, mm -hmm. of all that could actually look like, other than saying, oh, this is a really exotic pancake and, I don't know how it's yeah, made. well, that, that I've given some numbers, and of course, more in the relevant paper of the properties this pancake has to have. Yeah. But wouldn't it be good to start speculating with a pancake, like trying to build models for how that works? Yeah. Well, yeah. you have to understand plasma physics better than I, or well, I think anyone else understands. But with Yaji and Alex now, I think we've got some state of the art people that could do, you know, build a scenario. I mean, it's, I think that's a neat. Well, I would say, you know, if, if you can't understand why radio yeah, pulsars emit exactly. radio <laughs> pulses, um, and, you know, which are much better understood objects, you know what the magnetic fields are quantitatively, for example. If you can't explain that, you're really going to have a hard time explaining these things. Well, we're still arguing about what the source object is. And no one's going to deny that the crab pulsars are rotating magnetic neutron star and tell you even what the magnetic moment is. Uh, but here, you just don't know. You know, we're still arguing about is it a neutron star or isn't it a neutron star? And if so, what could the magnetic field be? And what's the radiation there? Mm -hmm. No, I agree. It's a good, very great exercise in logic to hone in on something. But I, I think, yeah, this is a good next step. I think Alex was going to say something. I see he's unmuted. So, yeah, I was just trying to say that uh, at least at least the current popular model can 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 um, at least explain most of the things that you raised. For example, um, because we have shown that you can launch a shock, which provides this pancake. Um, the low magnetic field uh, just means that the pancake emits very, very far away from the pulsar or, or magnetar. Uh, so the magnetic field at the emission region is actually pretty low. Um, it also is not a beam that sh that produces the shock. It's just a, an ejector, and the ejector doesn't is not a constant thing. An ejector um, doesn't have to be rotationally um, uh, correlated with with rotation phase. Is uh, you just launch an ejector like uh, uh, solar mass away, like like the solar mass ejection. Solar mass ejection doesn't uh, correlate with uh, with with rotation phase. So, so we will have. I think that that kind of naturally fits into this um, uh, all the puzzles together. So, I guess one last thing you want to go on another axis. Uh, so, what observations do you think would help constrain? These, these models, will it be more radio observation or would these pancakes ever be expected to emit, to be visible in, I don't know, no, optical? No, because they're radiating curvature radiation. So they're not going to, you know, which is gigahertz, 100 megahertz, 10 gigahertz. It's not going to suddenly be visible in 
And yet radio observations are much, much more sensitive than any others, um, partly because radio telescopes are bigger, and partly because they're not affected by quantum noise. They're only affected by the thermal noise temperature of the receiver, which is typically 30 degrees, which is um, a lot less than the quantum noise level in the optical thing. Um, no, what the observation I would like to see, well, first of all, it's a couple of few graphs back, um, I'd like to see, yeah, here we are. Okay, so we have this thing down here, whose width is, you can't, is not resolved on the scale, is 35 milliseconds. Is that really just pulsar sub, pulse substructure? In which case, it's not telling you anything about the um, uh, surrounding medium. Or really, are there bur bursts that are that close together that have different dispersion measures? That just requires collecting more pulses and more attention to the details of finding the dispersion measure because you, it's, it's a fitting procedure. And, you, and as a, you have two things that are so close together, there might be substructure of a single one, then the apparently different dispersion measure could simply be an artifact of how you fitted two parts of the same thing. So I don't really believe this point. I mean, I believe that it says essentially zero separation, but I don't believe that this is, it's actually 2.8, I think is necessarily right. It would tell you a great deal if it were, because um, this obviously is a few hundred times less than this, and would constrain R by a factor. I don't believe that. Be interesting. Okay. The second thing is, as I said, when you fit dispersion measure, now, because there are arguments that the plasma is almost critical density for the frequency, these measurements are obtained around 3 gigahertz. For that and where the critical density is 10 to the 11. Since um, uh, the estimates of the required column density combined with the time scale tell you you might be approaching 10 to the 11 per cubic centimeter, at least 10 to the 10, it's definitely worth looking for these higher order terms in the dispersion relation. Because if you can see <coughs> them, you get not just the conventional dispersion measure, which is a line integral, but the actual electron density. What what gives you 10 to the 11 per cubic centimeter? I mean, dense molecular clouds are 10 to the fifth per cubic centimeter. But or, or, the fifth yeah, but electrons tend to have uh, neutralizing <laughs> charges with them, right? Um, well, the point unless is they the blow them. Neutral molecules are no free electrons. Very, very few. And this is not a molecular cloud. This is a region of high energy density. No, what I'm getting at is, yeah, what, what the heck is that? Um, what is that region? What, well, kind of, what kind of clump is that? I, I don't know, but I'm, <laughs> sure, but I'm saying you could determine the electron density if you could get this higher order mm -hmm. term in the dispersion relation. If mm -hmm. You could measure it. I don't know if you can. You can set some sort of upper limit on it, but can you get it set a useful upper limit? I do not know, but you but, should try. But and what you, you, do you have any? First, so you can see how far over this, and there's clearly no correlation here, but how far over this way can you push this if you have, mm -hmm. you know, like another few hundred bursts? Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll be able to tighten this constraint. Sure, no, I nine agree. Nine seconds down yeah. to something smaller. That would be very interesting. Or maybe you won't. Maybe you'll see some correlation, and that tells you that, in fact, this is really the, the natural time scale, not one second, for example. Mm -hmm. And can you remind us what is special about this observation that so there's no other verse that have been observed, like so many repeating well, so many and varying dispersion. I mean, this other frequent repeater, um, you barely were able to get two changes in dispersion measure, and those were from epochs out hours apart. Other than that, no changes in dispersion measure have been observed until this. So there are some FRBs where you would make a plot that would look flat and would go down two hours, but not short well, that. Well, it would be saying? flat in the sense that multiple measurements should find the same dispersion measure. Yeah, so it would be at zero, basically. Delta and delta dm would be zero. Right. They'd, um, everything would be on this axis. Is that an observational statement or an instrumental statement? They, they could have seen this. No, it's observational. Because you might, the version measure is easy to measure. Okay. So if it had happened, it would have been seen. Yeah. But this is 
Yes, yeah. absolutely. And it's all in this paper that came out 10 days ago, you know. Hmm. This month. Oh, uh, what? So was this a this combination that was tying Green Bank to the parks? Or what, what, which one is this? What, what instrument is this again? Sorry, oh, mostly there were parks. Parks, OK. So yeah, I guess I, in this delta t distribution, I don't see any clear period or harmonics. And that... Certainly, there's no period. Yeah, of course, there's no yeah. periodicity. Um, yeah. No, but um, that's true. And the point is, there's no correlation. Mm -hmm. And you've looked at like phase diagrams. You've done delta t, and then you know you do the offset to delta t versus oh. delta t and delta t two, where you, you're basically. Well, people have looked in great detail for, and actually I have two to some extent, different of sources, different data. Um, okay. There's a lot of data available, and I actually, in one of these papers, analyzed for the other frequent repeater, 121102. And there are very compelling arguments that there's no periodicity. There's a, somebody else reported that he had 1,000 and 1,800, I think, first from this object, different paper, different group. Yeah, it's, but it's the phase, it, but they haven't not released their data. It's the phase space constraint. You know, you, you look at N plus one versus N, N plus two versus. <laughs> yeah, like devil's advocate, there could be a point oh, 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 two, five, and then sometimes you see. I don't know what a chaotic attractor is. It appeared to be randomly scattered. Well, no, but I mean. There might be an underlying. Okay, I have no idea what that is or how you'd look for it. But, but, no, but even simpler than that, um, if there are missing, you know, points, like let's say there was a point oh 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 two five uh, interval, then you'd also sometimes see twice that, three times that, four times that. So, you know, I mean, you have to do some okay. sort of there epic folding. Or, various people, including my yeah. own analysis from the data that's been made public, uh -huh. and one of the earlier, it's not that long earlier papers on this, they have not made their data public, so you can't do anything with it. Um, I've looked for periodicity, and there's no one that's ever found any evidence of it. I could see a point oh, 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 0002, for example, showing up. It would up. show up in this graph. It would show up in the timing. Right. And in fact, although I didn't include it in the talk, yes, I have a paper which is, you know, making it waiting for its second round of review, if I remember correctly, uh -huh. um, in which I, I re-examined the data looking, looking at periodograms, looking for periodicity, and there are various statistical arguments that there's no evidence of periodicity at a level which I think persuasively excludes it. Well, I think we've had a very... It's interesting discussion. I yeah. think we should be <laughs> respectful of Jonathan's time. <laughs> uh, because we've taken almost two hours of of this Friday morning. Uh, is there any last minute question that cannot wait till next time we run into each other? Yeah, we'll get it all again next week with Vicky. Yeah. It's a very different perspective. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay. Thanks a lot. Super interesting.